The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. I got an interesting question in the anonymous comment box, and I want to see how many other people agree with it. The comment went something like, is everything in this field of nuclear science engineering computational in nature? Because so far, we've pretty much just thrown theory and simulations at you. We haven't done any experiments. So who, who shares this concern or wonder? So one, two, three, four, four, OK, five, yeah. So getting towards roughly half of you. So I can confidently answer no. This is not a purely computational field. We just had to get you just enough science and physics so that you'd be able to understand some of the lab activities that we've got in store for you. One of whom, Mike Ames here from the Nuclear Reactor Lab, is going to be helping you with. Actually, two of them he'll be helping with. Two. Yeah. Oh, well, yes, your bananas. The bananas and the thing that we dreamed up today. So this morning. OK. So may I? you want to intro the sure. dream up, and I'll, I don't know. Fill in what I get wrong. Also, Mike's going to talk about what we're going to do together, which is called NAA, or Nuclear Activation Analysis. There are many, many ways of measuring what sort of impurities may exist in materials, and this is among the most sensitive. We happen to have a nuclear reactor. So what we will be doing, what I'm going to ask each of you guys to do for a special assignment, it's not graded, except you'll need it for the problem set, so it kind of is, is I want each of you to bring something into me that weighs about 50 milligrams in one piece, fits in here, is not fissionable, so if you have uranium at home, you know, I shouldn't know about it. And we also ask that you don't bring anything in that is too salty, because sodium activates like crazy. And each of you, using your knowledge of radioactive decay that we learned Tuesday and today, and the Bateman equations and series radioactive decay next Tuesday and Thursday, are going to calculate what impurities exist in your sample. What is your sample? It's You're not going to be able to do the calculation. We're going to make some estimates of oh, okay. the isotopes that you'll let us see. Okay. The shorts, yeah. Um, I know we're not going to get every impurity. Right? Well, we're not going to be able to run it next week. Yes, no, but I will want your materials next week. OK. So by Tuesday, I'd like each of you to come bring something in for which you'd like to know the elemental composition consisting of the following elements. Let's see. Problem sets. I think I've got it right up here. Let me just clone the screen. So you can see what we can look for. So this was provided to me by Mike. Um, we're going to do what's called a short nuclear activation analysis run, looking for any of the elements up on this list, shorts one with extremely short half-lives and shorts two with elements in the half-lives of hours. And Mike, I had a question for you sure. now that we're live. Can we count arsenic in that list? Because it's 24 point something hours. Yeah, we could do arsenic. Okay. It's not a great short element. You'd probably have to have something with a bunch of arsenic. So if any of you guys have some uh, food that you bought online and you don't know what sort of contaminants there are, or if you've got a piece of your fingernail and want to see if you are what you eat, or? Um, after telling you, boy, fingernails would be a great sample, um, we might run afoul of the human subjects in research issue with fingernails. What about dog fingernails? Believe it or don't. Ah, yes, yeah, so dogs are probably Okay, exempt. so clip your pet's claws if you want to see if they are what they eat or don't tell me what nail the thing came from, or you know, get a, you know, slice up a piece of a peanut, or whatever your favorite food is, or if you want to see if there are any metal dyes used in your clothing, cut out a little 50 milligram square. It'll be like a fashion statement and an experiment at the same time. <laughs> right? So we asked that it's about 50 milligrams. It's got to fit in here. It's got to be not that salty and not fissionable. And we're going to pack a couple of these in one of these rabbits, these polyethylene rabbits, we call it those, one, because everything in nuclear is named after animals and farm implements for some reason. Did I go over that with you guys the first day of class? Barns, shakes, pigs, rabbits. OK, so a rabbit is a little capsule. How do you, do you pop open or you screw it open? Oh yeah, there's like a square nut at the top. Just a little capsule that goes through a pneumatic tube, kind of like the old bank machines. And it'll go firing into the reactor, sit there for a while, and get pneumatically sucked back out so that we can calculate the activation and decay of the isotopes within. And a pig is just a big, heavy thing of lead where you keep pieces of things that you have irradiated for shielding. 
So if you notice the sort of methodology theme here, farms, pigs, rabbits, barns, shakes. Anyone else know any f other farmy nuclear units? Yeah? Or farmy anything? So the detectors in NIF are called toads and bullfrogs. Why is that? So it actually, bullfrog stands for something. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Okay. Yeah. Oh yes, the acronym for acronym, as well as what I study, which is CRUD, or Chalk River Unidentified Deposits. It's the gunk that builds up on fuel rods. Well, I talked to a fellow from Chalk River who took extreme offense to this detriment in nuclear power plants being attributed to his fine laboratory. Oh, I thought it was chromium rich. Oh, see, that would work, but they're not actually chromium rich. Well, yeah. Cool. So, Mike, do you want to say anything uh, else? Yeah, the only thing I want to say, so, uh, yeah, so, do you want to introduce yourself to you? Oh, yes, sorry. I'm Mike Gaines. Uh, I work over at the Nuclear Reactor Lab, uh, mostly doing E-Core experiments, but I also run the NAA lab there. Um, and I've been doing it for a while. So the idea, uh, the reason I, we've got these guys, I'll irradiate the samples in this. Um, the easiest thing for me to do without losing any of your samples is after something gets irradiated in this, I snip the top off. And you probably can't see that, but it's a little poly bag. I'll dump your sample into the poly bag. So something that's like one piece works the best. What I usually tell people is something that you could pick up reasonably easy, easily with a pair of tweezers. Um, that way, if I drop it, I can actually pick it up with the tweezers. But that kind of gives you a good size. Please, no, nothing too powdery, because the powder is kind of spread around and then gets contamination. Um, yeah, and that list there, I guess you said you posted it. Yep, um, the list is posted yes. on the Stellar we'll, site. Uh, yeah, yeah, so, um, yeah, we'll see mostly these light elements, the guys with the asterisks, um, I don't see that well. Yeah, gallium, I'm probably not going to see that. So be interesting you know, if we found gallium in your dog claws or something. Yeah, you know, magnesium, aluminum, titanium, vanadium, those are easy. Uh, sodium chloride, potassium are easy. The manganates will come out nicely. Um, some of the elements of m generally more interest down further down, you know, Even arsenic, further. selenium, chromium. Those are those have longer half lives, so I won't see those. Yep. Um, we'll yeah. probably do like a five or ten minute irradiation, let it uh, decay for a little while, and then we'll do, we'll do a couple of counts. And if you ever get over to the reactor, we will be there a fair bit. Oh yeah, you guys are going to be there next week. Yeah. Right? So what do you usually use NAA for? Um, NIA, well, the thing we've been using it for lately a lot is anything that's going to go in the core of the reactor, we want to analyze to see if there's any surprise elements, um, how much, to see how much cobalt is in a piece of steel that we're going to put in, because people don't usually measure the cobalt, but it activates really well, and so that causes problems later on when we have to take something apart and it's full of cobalt-60, or hafnium that shows up in things that you don't expect it. Um, mm -hmm. uh, my past in doing NAA was all environmental samples. So we did a lot of trace element, heavy metal chemistry on atmospheric particulates, rainwater, <laughs> ice cores, lake sediments, fish, I don't know, uh, crude oil, coal, fly ash, you know, and so we would measure that whole stack of elements in those guys uh, for environmental studies. Cool. That was my. I don't know. I think that's enough. You want me sure. back here next Tuesday or Thursday? -ish? Yeah, to explain a little bit more the specifics yeah, of the process. The, I'll give you the five, ten minutes. And if you guys could, um, I mean, are you guys going to be able to come to the lab when we do the shorts? Uh, depends on when you do them. If it's early November, then yes. Yeah, okay. Um, so when I the shorts, we, I put two samples in one of these guys. It goes shwink into the reactor and out. Which you guys should see. It's pretty yeah, cool. It's kind of, yeah, you can, you can watch that part. Um, <coughs> And then I run it down the hallway and throw each sample on a detector. And while those samples are counting, I run another rabbit. So it's kind of an all-day thing of running up and down the hall every half hour. Um, so you could almost mm -hmm. come any time during the day while I'm running these and you know get one full round in half an hour. Cool. I think 
think that's the whole story. You can hang on to that. Yeah. If you want. Thanks, Mike. So you heard the charge. Bring me your dog claws, your head, you know, eyebrows, your skin flakes, your scabs, oh, your yeah. food pieces. Hair? Oh yeah. So I no mean, hair. I used to do, oh, we used to do a bunch <laughs> of hair analysis. Hair is a pain in the neck because it's the static static static. It clings to everything and it gets stuck to parts. Um, yeah, we did some hair analysis for the super fun site in Uber, and it was yeah. a big success, but it was not pleasant to do the work. So don't bring us your hair, but bring us your skin flakes, your scabs, your dog claws, your food scraps, no your skin <laughs> <laughs> just don't tell them. Stuff that you can like, like I said, something that's like one good piece and you can pick it up. Yeah, get creative. It would be great. It doesn't have to be something that I said. As long as it's not fissionable or salty. And we might veto samples. You, I do need to know what they are roughly before we throw it in the reactor, and we might end up vetoing some samples. Yeah, but so let's figure it out by Tuesday. That way, if we have to veto, we have a while for you guys to find another sample. Or, yeah, I don't know if I'll be able to run a sample from every place. But we'll see. You know, we'll see. We'll see what we can anyway, do. Anyway, I'll see you all next week. Thanks, Mike. So yeah, so Mike's going to be helping us do some nuclear activation analysis. And in addition, next week we're going to be counting our big bag of burnt bananas because now that you're learning about radioactivity and this, when we go over activity and series decay, you'll have enough of the science to understand, to calculate how to, what is the radioactivity of one banana. And to do so, we need like 500 bananas to get enough statistics. So we'll be going to the reactor for that. We've also set it up so that next week and the week afterwards, you guys are going to be manipulating the power levels of the reactor. So you actually get to sit in the control seat, raise and lower the control rods, and watch the power of the reactor change in ways you probably won't expect, unless you're getting operator training. <laughs> and all of that stuff is going to be used in the lab components of the problem sets. So you might, guys might have noticed there was some spintharoscope thing on problem set three. Radiation protection did not want me taking smoke detectors apart and giving them all to you, because that's distributing open radio radiation sources and probably shouldn't do that. But we've got plenty of lab stuff for you to do to see what is actually hands-on in this field. And if you do want to know what else is hands-on, I have an experimental group, and you're always welcome to come see what we do at the lab. There usually isn't an explosion happening, but there's usually something at 1,000 to 1,500 Celsius temperature, uh, blue uranium fluoride salts, you know, nanonewton forces at, at extreme pressures, or what have you. We do a lot of it. So I wanted to give a quick review of where we were in radioactive decay last time, I think we left off somewhere around particle physics telescope explodes, was uh, my favorite BBC headline ever, when we were talking about, we've already gone over alpha decay, we've gone over beta decay, we started talking about positron decay, and the neutrinos that come out of that, and this Kamiokande detector that is set up with lots of expensive phototubes to detect the cones of light left as neutrinos pass faster than the speed of light in water, through water. And then there's my favorite headline. <laughs> and I believe we made it up to the end of positron annihilation spectroscopy, or ways that you can actually use positron emission to look at the number and types of atomic defects in crystalline materials. And yep, that's where we left off. Interested in PAS? Lots of papers to check out. In the meantime, let's look at one of the competing mechanisms for positron emission, which is uh, electron capture. In this case, so I will warn you, it's uh, sometimes a little easy to get mixed up between electron capture, internal conversion, isomeric transition. So I've left these slides on here, and I also took pictures of the board from last time and posted them on the Stellar site. So all the blackboards where we filled the boards, there's pictures of those. And I'm going to keep doing that. So if you learn better just by looking and listening rather than writing everything, feel free. If you want to write stuff down, also feel free. So in electron capture, another way of, well, destroying positive charge would be for the nucleus to capture an electron. So either it can emit a positron, giving away some positive charge, or it can capture an electron, destroying one of the positive charges. And in each case here, we've got a proton that becomes a neutron and a something. I won't be specific as to which one, because positron and electron capture, well, two different but similar kind of decay mechanisms. And then what you get is this hole where the electron used to be. And that's not a very stable configuration for an atom to have, let's say, one fewer electron than protons, and especially to have a hole in the inner shell. So you get this cascade from straight up from high school chemistry of electrons falling from one shell to the next, 
and giving off characteristic x-rays. That's me that crossed that out there. Because you will find misinformation all over the place online. And someone might make a great figure and mislabel an electron emitted photon as a gamma ray. And remember, we said gammas come from the nucleus. Otherwise, they're indistinguishable photons. And so an electron capture, you don't need much of an energy difference between the parents and the daughters, unlike positron decay, where for positron decay to happen, you have to have Q at least equal to 1.022 MeV, which is the same as 2 times the rest mass of the electron. For electron capture, you don't. This can happen at just about any energy. As long as you can overcome just the binding energy of the electron, which is negligible compared to these sort of nuclear energy levels. And so this is the Q equation. Keep in mind these deltas here are excess masses. So I'll put this up again. The excess mass is the real mass minus the terrible approximation of a nucleide's mass. And this way, excess mass and real mass are directly related. So you could plug in masses here. You could plug in binding energies by making everything with a minus sign, and so on. I think I've repeated myself enough for the uh, Q equation stuff. Would you guys agree? Yeah, OK. And so these are actually two competing mechanisms. So shown here is the decay of sodium-22, which we don't want to happen in our nuclear activation analysis because it gets pretty toasty. It can either proceed. There's a kind of hidden part of the diagram that I drew in to make a little more sense. You start off with a nucleus at 2.8 MeV above the neon nucleus's energy level. You need 1.022 MeV to create the positron-electron pair, at which point you can emit the positron with a certain energy. You're left at an excited state, and the next thing we'll go over is gamma decay or isomeric transitions, or IT. That's the next method of decay we'll talk about. Or the nucleus can just capture an electron, getting to that same energy level and emitting the same gamma ray. So these are two competing mechanisms of decay. And then you might ask, well, when is one going to happen and not the other? Well, chances are the lower energy that transition is, the more likely a, um, electron capture is going to happen. So when you look at these energy diagrams, you can see that as the transitions get bigger, the probability of positron decay goes up and up and up. So you need 1.022 MeV to make the positron and electron, but the probability of positron decay very close to this is, far, is fairly low. Possible, but unlikely. Is everyone clear on these two competing mechanisms? So one way of reducing the number of protons is emit a positron. Another is gobble up an electron. In the end, they make the same daughter products, but they go by different mechanisms. And they give off different bits of radiation uh, which we can actually sense and measure. Cool. So on to gamma decay, or isomeric transition. These range from the dead simple, like technetium-99 metastable, giving off a characteristic 140 keV gamma ray for technetium. That's the medical imaging procedure we've talked a lot about. To the ridiculously complex, like americium-241, which has a lot, a lot, a lot of different nuclear energy states, all of which release anywhere between one and a lot of gamma rays. And this is what's referred to as isomeric transition. So we'll say gamma or isomeric transition is like the same thing. They're just different words for it. Uh, these are called isomers. They've got the same number of protons and neutrons, so it's the same nuclide, but at an excited state. And we call it gamma decay because we emit gamma rays or photons. I think this one's the easiest one to understand because the reaction goes something like, let's say we have a parent nucleus with Z protons and A neutrons. Nothing happens. It's about the easiest nuclear reaction there is. Except you do give off a gamma ray. And we'll usually put a star or something to denote an excited state. So when you see a star in the reading, over there on a nuclide where the charge would be, <coughs> that's an excited energy state that will likely decay by IT or gamma decay. There is also a competing mechanism <coughs> for uh, isomeric transition or gamma decay, and that's what's called internal conversion. 
In this case, you can kind of think of it, this isn't the correct physical explanation, but it's a perfectly good mental model, that the gamma ray would either just be emitted from the nucleus, at which point you would see it, and the energy of the gamma is the same as that Q, or it kind of hits an electron on its way out, ejecting that electron. So instead of finding a gamma ray, you may just get an electron emitted at an energy very, very close to that gamma ray. The difference between the gamma ray energy and the electron energy is its binding energy. Because if a gamma hits an electron on the way out, it has to overcome the binding energy of that electron, at which point the rest of the energy is just its kinetic energy. So again, I don't think that's the precise physical mechanism, but it's a perfectly good mental model to remember what this is. A gamma can either just get out on its own, or it can hit an electron on its way out. If you hit the electron on your way out, just like in electron capture, then you get a, lar a uh, larger shell electron falling down to the inner shell, emitting an x-ray just like before. And then there's one other process I want you guys to be aware of. Has anyone here ever heard of Auger electron emission? Or, yeah. So in this case, instead of sending out an x-ray, you can think of it like the x-ray kind of hits the another electron on its way out. That's not the actual process that happens, but let's just think of it like that. And then that electron is ejected, usually from a much outer shell. And we can actually use these Auger electrons, because they have specific but very low binding energies, to do imaging and elemental analysis of materials. So this is another one of those things where the stuff you're learning today is used in an Auger electron microscope up in building 13 to do combined imaging and elemental analysis of materials. I want to skip back a sec, because let's say we have this decay diagram right here, a pretty simple one, cesium-137, that isotope that everyone was worried about from the release from Fukushima, can either proceed by just beta decay or beta decay followed by an isomeric transition. And shown here is a spectrum of all the different electron energies that you'll get out. If you remember from last time when we talked about, let's see, the energy of a beta particle emitted versus, let's say, the number of those particles emitted. If this is the Q value for that reaction, you don't always get a beta particle out at the Q value. In fact, you never do. It looks something like this, where there'll be some, let's say, average or some most likely beta energy, which is about 1 third Q. Depends on the reaction, but that's a good rule of thumb. So if you've got a 1.174 MeV beta particle, you're going to see a spectrum of electron energies ranging from 0 to 1.174. And you've got this other beta uh, transition possible at about half an MeV. So you're going to see that same spectrum right there. And then there's these two, what's called the conversion electrons. That's evidence of the competing process with gamma decay which is to say that this gamma decay can either just get out, at which point you see a gamma ray of that energy, or that gamma hits an electron on its way out, knocking those electrons out. Does anyone know here what it means by K-shell or L-shell? If you do, just shout it out. So that there depends on the, oh, that's correct, it's, it's the energy level. So let's say, We'll draw kind of a Bohr model of a nucleus. We'll call it N. And let's give it three electron energy levels. And let's say there's a couple electrons in the first shell and some electrons in the outer shells. And let's say this electron was struck on its way out by a gamma ray. So it's gone. At this point, you might have an electron fall from, let's call this level 2, to level 1. And so this 2 to 1 transition is called a K transition. Don't ask me why the letters are the way they are. I probably have read it and have forgotten it because it wasn't that intuitive. But this is referred to as a K transition. So you may have what's called a K alpha or a K beta line. That depends on if you have an even higher energy shell. But whatever this letter is, it tells you what energy level the electron is going to. 
So the K lines would be here. The L line, yeah, I'm sorry. Let me, let me back up and say that again. So the idea here is that if this is the, but let's see, which one is this? 0.662. So if the gamma ray is at 0.662 MeV, which would be about there, notice that these K shell and L shell lines aren't quite 0.662. That's because they have to overcome the binding energy of the electron to get out. So to jump back to this diagram right here, the gamma ray loses a little bit of energy in freeing the electron, the rest of which can become kinetic energy, which is why you can see that the electron, let's say, was ejected from the K-shell here. And yeah? So internal conversion is the actual process of going through like the process of the gamma ray to take an electron. I will, I will say that internal conversion, you can imagine a mental model of the gamma ray hits an electron on its way out. Physically, it's more complicated. Okay. Yes. Like yeah. Yep. So if you want to remember, like, what's what, I would say just remember this diagram right here. Yeah, Kristen? Just the, you, you get just the electron. Good question. Is the gamma rays effectively absorbed in freeing the electron from its bound shell and then imparting kinetic energy? Yep. That's right, so that's correct. Um, so I'll, we'll, I'll spend the next couple slides going over what OJ electron emission is, but not till we finish the, uh, the easier stuff, because OJ is a little complicated. Did I see another question out here? Cool. So again, all the competing methods for gamma decay, one, the gamma can just get out. Two, the gamma can knock out an electron from, let's say, the K shell or the L shell, or the M shell, and so on and so on, depending on what element you have. So I'll just label these, like this would be like the K shell, this would be the L shell, this would be the M shell. Now I want you to notice something too. The K shell electron, ejected from the innermost electron, is slightly lower than the L shell electron. Why do you guys think that is? Well, let's, let's look at the energetics for this process, right? The electron energy level is whatever the gamma ray level is minus the binding energy. Which of these two electrons, the K-shell or the L-shell, do you think is going to be more tightly bound? The K-shell. The innermost electron is more bound, so it takes away more energy from that gamma ray. Let's say this is the gamma. It takes more energy to eject an electron from the K-shell than the L-shell. Or in other words, the gamma loses less energy, ejecting a less bound electron. So that's why you see these. If there were an M shell, there, I don't know what element this was drawn for, uh, but let's say, oh, for cesium. So there probably is an M shell. It's just that as you get down in energy levels, the probability of finding an electron from these outer and outer energy levels gets way and way less likely. So you'd usually just see a K or an L shell electron. And if I ask you to draw one of these on a problem set or an exam, just drawing the K and the L shells is perfectly sufficient. Because that way, at least you'll know that there's a couple possibilities. Yeah? What are the two curves on the next step? On this one? Yeah. So these two curves represent the probability of finding an electron emitted at that energy. Okay. So this curve right here, where you get a maximum beta energy of 512 keV, comes from that beta decay. And the maximum for the 1.174 comes from this beta decay. So the total curve would be the sum of each of these four things. If I just said draw the total probability of detecting an electron at that temperature, you just add those up. I saw two other questions, or were they the same thing? Yeah? Uh, yeah, I was going to ask what the lower one is, but uh, his question made me think. So is it kind of like the area under both those curves sums to 1? Because the probability, given that like 0.512 max is 95% of the Ah, so the, so the question was, is the area under each of these curves 1? Not with this scale. Here we're just showing a relative number of electrons. So if you want to find what's the total probability that cesium will emit an electron of each energy, if you integrate under all of these curves, that will sum to 1. If you're looking at just one of these decays and you're saying, if cesium undergoes this decay, what's the probability of each of these energy levels? Then you only integrate under the relevant curve. What's more practical is usually 
what's the probability of finding any electron at any energy from cesium? Then you take into account all the possible decays, draw all the curves independently, add them up, and you get the total probability function, whose area will be 1. Yes? So again, you did say that all, an L shell electron will be ejected with the right wing, then the K shell will be less heavy Wait, can you say the last part again? So you said the L shell electron will be ejected with the right wing, then the K shell due to the fact that it's heavy bound. That's correct. So the L shell electron in the second shell is less tightly bound than the first one, which is why it's ejected with more energy. It doesn't take as much of the gamma's energy to get it out. If you were to get, let's say, the outermost electron ejected, which happens in OJ, which we'll go over next, it can take up anywhere from like 1 to 7 eV. Really, really low energies. That's what we call the work function, or the, the energy required to, ion to take the outermost electron out. So any other questions on this before I go to OJ and show you that process? Cool. So then let's get into what is OJ electron emission. It's exactly, Luke, is that what you said? Were you asking about it? Uh, yeah. yeah. So it's exactly like what Luke said. Normally, if you have a hole in a lower level energy shell, an electron from a higher shell will fall down to fill it, emitting an x-ray. A competing process for this is another electron from a very similar energy shell will get ejected instead. The mental model for this, which again is not the true physical picture, but it's perfectly fine to think of it like this, the x-ray hits another electron on its way out. And you can look at the energetics accordingly. Where for OJ emission, let's say the kinetic energy of the OJ electron is the difference in the final and initial electron energy states minus the binding energy of the OJ electron, which will usually be very low. Because the OJ electron that's emitted is usually one of the outer shell electrons. So to help make this a little more concrete, I wanted to show, uh, we'll do a little calculation example. It's just addition, so it's not that hard. So let's say we were measuring, I don't even know what this is, and we started to see some characteristic OJ electrons for copper, platinum, carbon, and oxygen. And the question is, why do we see oxygen coming out right there at about 501 eV? Very, very low energy compared to what we've been talking about. We can actually look at the binding energies of some of the different electrons in oxygen. Luckily, there aren't that many electrons in oxygen. The first, the only, well, the only K electrons, let's say, have a binding energy of 532 eV. The L1 is 24. And then the L3, something else in one of the other p orbitals, is 7 eV. And so the formula is pretty simple. It's just 532 minus 24. That's the difference between the final and initial energy levels, minus the 7 to free that outer electron comes to 501 eV, which is exactly where you see the OJ line for oxygen. So when I ask you what are all the possible things that you could see during the decay of something, 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 if I were to show you this curve and ask you what's missing, what would you do? Where would you draw the OJ electrons on this curve? Yep. Like almost on the axis. Yep. 500 eV would be like, I don't know, one pixel away on this graph. But if you want a complete answer to this question, you've got to take into account all the possible beta energies for all the possible beta decay mechanisms, all of the possible conversion electrons for whatever gammas come out. In this case, there's only one gamma. and OJ electrons, which could compete with X-ray emission. So, everyone clear on that? Yeah. So the question is, if you, if you eject an electron from one of the inner shells, does that eventually create an OJ electron, right? It can. These are competing processes. So either the x-ray can just escape during that transition, or we'll assume that it hits another electron on its way out and emits an OJ electron. So these are also competing processes. So you'll see one or the other. In reality, you'll see a lot of both with different probabilities, because you're usually not looking at one atom.
it's usually looking at a lot. Cool. Any other questions on IT as, a, as an isomeric transition or internal conversion or OJ, what this is all about? Cool. I wanted to give you one note too that these OJ electrons are really, really low energy, which means the only ones that get out of the material are in the top like tens or so of nanometers of the material. So it's a very surface sensitive technique. So if you want to do really detailed surface analysis or profiling, you can scan an electron beam across the sample and then collect the OJ electrons that come out, skipping ahead our calculation, and get like an elemental profile that'll tell you how much of each element is where depending on how many of its OJ electrons you can count. And it's, pretty, it's a pretty cool technique. They're just machines that do this now. Uh, any interest in seeing one of these at the Center for Material Science and Engineering? Because we could try to arrange that too. Cool, okay. I'll see what I can do. That'll be fun. And the last decay that we haven't talked about and did not show up in our generalized decay diagram from last time, we did talk about neutron decay. There's one other one that probably wouldn't fit on this diagram. Does anyone know what it is? Spontaneous fission. So this can happen, yeah, that's right. This happens with very heavy elements. Then usually the heavier it is or the less stable it is, the higher probability this is, at which the nucleus can once in a while, it, nuclei just explode sometimes, uh, giving off two fission products, any number of neutrons, usually between one and three, uh, a couple of gamma rays, some antineutrinos, and a whole bunch of other craziness. And so that, of course, doesn't fit on the diagram, but it is another type of decay that I'll ask you guys to analyze on the homework. And here's a hint. You already analyzed part of it in problem set one. I'll ask you to go a little deeper in problem set three. So you know, anyone have a question I saw? Cool. Okay. Bear with me because I skipped back to like slide really far away. Oh, cool. That thing actually works. Right to the summary. So in summary, the radioactive decay processes are more, I think the energetics are pretty easy. The formulas aren't that hard to remember because most of them are just parents minus daughters minus something. But what I do want you to remember is which mechanisms compete with which other ones and why. And if I were to tell you, draw me a spectrum of photons that you may see from the decay of cesium-137, or draw me a spectrum of electrons, you'd be able to draw what that is so that when you go do lab number four and we count our big bag of burnt bananas, and you know that there's potassium-40 in there, you know what peaks to start looking for. Because you're not just going to see, let's, let, let's do a little flash forward to detectors now, and some other stuff that nuclear engineers actually do on a daily basis. Let's say you're counting the energy of photons as a function of, let's say, uh, the number of photons that you count. You're never, you're almost never just going to see a lone potassium-40 peak like that. It's very, very rare that you would just capture the gamma ray as is. There's going to be a lot of other things that will go into it, which I'm not going to give away yet, because we're going to go over photon interactions in like a week or two. But you do have to think about, well, what other x-rays might you see? What if, the gamma, what if this gamma ray hits an electron on the way out, and then you end up with some x-rays? Let's say you might have some K-level x-rays and some L-level x-rays and maybe some M's. These could all be possible as well. I'll just label those real quick. Does anyone know how to find these energies? What those x-ray levels are? Anyone ever heard of the Lyman series? The, uh, the emission lines from ionized hydrogen or anything like that? That's kind of the, the simpler case of it. The idea here is if you want to figure out what's the wavelength of light that's going to be emitted, it'll be this, this thing called the Rydberg constant, a more complex formula for which I have in the notes, times 1 over your shell, final shell squared minus 1 over your initial shell squared. So the idea here is that you can look up these this Rydberg constant for any element that you have. And there's actually, there's what's called an R infinity constant that I think you just multiply by Z. I forget what power it is, but I will get it for you next time. 
And then it's just a matter of the squares between the final and the initial shell levels, where n can vary from 1 to theoretically infinity. Realistically, I've never heard of anything beyond a g orbital. So let's just say it's that, or something like that. I'll, put, I'll leave the infinity there. That's technically correct. OK. And so all you need to do is either look up or calculate this constant for your element, and then plug in the numbers of the shells, and you know what sort of photon energy you're going to get out. And to make that easier for you, I think now is a good time to introduce the NIST x-ray tables. So I want to make sure you can see my screen. And I'm going to show you something that's on the Stellar site, which will help you figure this stuff out. Let me do O1. Good, you can see. Probably will make me log in. And all the way at the bottom of the material section, there's the NIST X-ray Transition Energy Database. So for example, you can look at, I don't know, we were looking at cesium, right? Let's find cesium. And you can start to look at all transitions. Uh, let's look at the simplest one, KL1, an electron going from shell number two to shell number one. Get transitions. And you end up with a table of these energies in electron volts. So if I were to ask you, let's say, uh, what sort of gamma rays might you see coming off of cesium, that would be the most likely one, where you're more likely to eject an inner shell electron, and it's most likely that a number two shell electron will fall down to a number one, or from the L shell to the K shell, whatever you want to call it, or the some level orbital to some other levels. There seems to be like eight different letters that describe the same thing. Mm -hmm. Hope you guys get the idea. If you want to look at all the possible transitions, I have to zoom back out again. Yeah. Let's just scroll through it. But what I want you to notice is that all of the KL transitions are within like a couple hundred EV from each other. So this is like the first or second or third L shell electron falling to the K level. So they call it the KL1, KL2, KL3. They're all from the L shell. They all just might be one of the different electrons occupying that shell, which is why they're not that different. So if I asked you, draw all of the all of the uh, x-rays and gammas coming out, I don't want to see a line for every single level. I'm very happy for you just to say, this line represents the KL series. This line represents the KM series, all the things from shell 3 to shell 1. Notice also that because it's final minus initial squared, which I covered up, falling from an even further outer shell to the same inner shell should give you a higher energy, which it does, by like 5 keV. And then the kN levels, another 500 eV up. They don't have KOs. Interesting, but they have the K edge. Does anyone know what the K edge is? Exactly, it's, it's level infinity, which would mean an electron from somewhere else, right? So this, in effect, is like the energy it takes to ionize a K electron or the X-ray that you would get from an electron falling all the way into the K shell. So this is your kind of level infinity. Notice it's not that different from level five. That's why I wrote six. I erased it for theoretical correctness. But in all practicality, you won't see much else. Did someone have a question? I thought I saw a hand. OK. Let's look at the L series. Oh, yes. Sometimes you see L alpha and L beta. Yep. Yeah, that's another, exactly. Yeah, there's the L alphas, the L betas, or you may see L alpha 1 and 2 and L beta 1 and 2. So L designates that it's going to shell level 2. Alpha or beta is like LM or LN. Again, I, I think I've ranted about notations before. Uh, physics is notorious, because whoever gets to describe something and gets enough people to infect with the notation that you decide, it sticks. But the main patterns to look at then is, let's say, the L1, M, whatever. This is from level 3 to level 2. Notice how much lower in energy these are. And the L edge, 
5 keV compared to like 36 keV. And all of these sort of different transitions you can calculate with this formula. So this is just kind of tabulated this formula for you. So whatever you're more comfortable doing is putting this in Excel, look it up on NIST, your choice. Yeah? Oh, what is the largest NF, you mean? Yeah, what, what number is that the For that, I'll put my practical uh, thing back there. You'll never see it much higher than six, unless you're talking about actinides and super heavy elements with even crazier shell levels. But you'll put the integer shell number, regardless of whether they call it L or S or whatever. They just put the number here, and that will give you the a pretty good approximation of the energy transition. Does anyone remember this from high school? I hope they're teaching this now. Oh, they did in 511.1. Oh, that's good to hear. What about 309.1? Anyone take that? No one took 309.1. Wow, OK. Usually it's like half and half or so. Cool. And let's see, how far does it go? All the way to the L3 ends and the L3 edge. So. That's the biggest element they have, talking about ridiculous transitions. Yeah. So notice also, as you go up in, that's, that, that's number 100. So this is the heaviest one they have, so most likely to have the largest number of levels. So here, the KL1 is like 114 keV, sometimes indistinguishable from some of these smaller nuclear energy level transitions. So Remember I said before, chemistry and nuclear differ by about a factor of a million. Well, not so if you're talking about weak gammas versus heavy elements K-shell transitions, or their K-edges. Let's see, the, yeah, the largest x-ray you'd expect would be the K-edge at 142 keV. And the technetium-99 uh, gamma ray comes out at 140 keV. How do you know if it's a gamma or an x-ray? You don't unless you have really, really good energy resolution and you can tell them apart. Yep? So this formula in this chart is only for calculating the energy of x-rays, right? Correct. This so alternatively use the gamma? Uh, things get quantum. So the question was, this formula in this chart, yes, this is only for x-rays and electron shells. There are probably equivalent calculations for nuclear energy levels. I will say that's a 2202 and far beyond topic. Uh, for the nuclear energy levels, just use the decay diagrams to find those. Yeah. The, uh, the, the uh, table of nuclides and all their different diagrams. Cool. How far do we go here? L and, yep, there's no O's. So they never talk about anything beyond shell level four, even for fermium. So, huh, I stand corrected. Okay. Cool. So what I wanted to show you quickly is, is that series of hydrogen emission lines. So how familiar does this look to folks? Where you can have a transition from <laughs> level three to level two, level four to level two, and you can actually, this is a kind of neat thing to verify. I don't have it as a problem set question because it's not very nuclear, but you can try this on your own and verify that you can actually calculate the expected wavelength of these photons coming off of excited hydrogen. Also notice here, it goes all the way out to nine and out to infinity. Because this is electronic excitation. You won't usually get the ejection of anything beyond an M or an N electron, even in the largest elements from, uh, let's say, from IC, what is it? From internal conversion. But you can electronically excite them to whatever energy level, to the point of even ionizing them. That's where the infinity comes in. Cool, so it's like two of five of. So I want to open this up to any questions about decay before we move upstairs to talk about activity, half-life, and series radioactive decay, which is what nuclear activation analysis is all about. So anything here? Yep. Mm-hmm. Correct. In our pre in in our other notation, this would be known as an LM electron. And probably L1, M1, because there's only one electron in hydrogen. Yep. So don't let the notations trip you up as long as you've, I'm sure someone's got a chart of 
L, you know, L equals 2 equals whatever other Greek letter someone has designated it for. There's just different ways of saying the same thing. So as long as you know the physics, looking up the notation is just kind of a little pain. Any other questions on radioactive decay or competing mechanisms? Cool. Let's take a 10 minute break. So I'll see you guys upstairs in room 307 in 10 minutes. There's no projector there, so we'll do it all on the board. All right, so I want to start off the second half of today's class uh, by posing and answering a question. Who's still mentally having trouble grasping this idea? What did I tell you? Yeah, so whoever I said it to, I said at least half the class is right there with you. It's true. So in a sentence, it's this. Q is the conversion of mass to energy. That's all. And the whole point of doing this nuclear reaction energetics to find out if things are or aren't allowed, if they're exo or endothermic, is to see how much mass is converted to energy or how much energy has to be converted to mass. And if you have trouble remembering, just go back to the equation that I see on everybody's t-shirts. And like I said on the first day of class, everyone's got it on their shirts and no one quite understands it, not even the nuclear engineers. Because it's very difficult mentally to grasp the idea that energy and matter are two sides of the same coin or two different forms of the same thing. So for a, a, a nuclear reaction where Q is greater than zero or exothermic, all that means is that energy is spontaneously created from the destruction of mass. That's all. And for a Q less than zero reaction or endothermic, <coughs> When you inject energy into the system, it is absorbed and mass is created straight from this equation. So does this make more sense to the folks that raise their hands, which is almost everybody? Q is nothing but a quantification of the amount of matter and energy that turn from one to the other. And all the balance stuff we've been doing for almost the last month has been to conserve, to quantify, and to predict it. So hope that helps. I know that MIT students have this gift for being able to hide behind the math. And I know that's true because I used to be one myself. And you could get through the day or get through the class getting the math right without really understanding the physics or the mechanism behind what's going on. So everything we've done for the last three weeks can be summed up in one sentence. Mass and energy are the same thing. We've just had a lot of math to get there and be able to, yeah, it still kind of makes your head want to explode, right? You think about it, if you make an, we want to make an endothermic ha reaction happen, you have to put kinetic energy into one of the particles. <coughs> and that system, in the just barely allowed state, the nuclei won't really be moving, or at least the set, yeah, the nuclei won't really be moving afterwards because you'll have turned energy into matter. So that kinetic energy is turned into mass energy. Just like you can turn potential into kinetic or thermal into mechanical or vice versa, it's other forms of energy. Kind of mind blowing. Well anyway, so now that we've finished radioactive decay, I want to get into the concept of activity, half-life, and then we're going to start but not finish serial radioactive creation and destruction. In your readings, you'll see an equation that looks something like this, where we're going to be at the end of the day today. If you want to show off how much of some isotope N1 exists as a function of time? You may have seen something that looks like this. We're going to be able to understand how these equations are created. And because this is MIT, we're going to take it further and add specifically driven mechanisms. Like, can you create an isotope not just by decay from one isotope to another, but by intentionally making it, which is exactly how NAA, or nuclear activation analysis, works. You fire neutrons into a material, they turn into something else and start decaying in series. This is what we're going to be working out the math for, but I want to make sure at every step that we get the physics right. So first, a very quick primer on where, what, what is activity and where does half-life come from? So we define the a, the activity of a substance, as pretty simple. It depends on the amount of the substance that's there, and it depends on 
what's called this decay constant. So this amount, let's just say like atoms, and this decay constant is in units of one over second. And activity is in, let's say, atoms destroyed or decays per second. That thing right there is called the decay constant, lambda. And if we want to see, let's say, how much of a substance is decaying at a certain time or what's its activity, and get a measure of how quickly does it take to decay away, we can start by saying, well, this, in effect, is a destruction rate of isotope n. So we can make the simplest of differential equations and say the amount of substance n as a function of time is just minus its activity, which equals minus lambda n. I hope I don't have to explain how to solve this differential equation, so I'm going to go through it pretty quickly. What's the method you use for this to get n as a function of t? Yes, you're all in 1803 or have finished 1803, right? This should have been day one, so we'll just separate variables, divide each side by n, multiply each side by dt, so we get dn over n equals negative lambda dt. You can integrate both sides, and we get the natural log of n equals minus lambda t plus some integration constant. We're going to do a little bit of trickery and to make things in a nice form that we can deal with. Let's just call this log of n naught. They're just numbers, right? We haven't defined what this constant of integration is. Everyone cool, cool with us doing that? So then we can subtract log of n naught from each side. And we get log n minus log of n naught equals minus lambda t. So this is like saying log of n over n naught equals minus lambda t. We'll take e to the power of both sides and we get n over n naught equals e to the minus lambda t. And right there you've got your exponential decay equation. This is the easy part. And what this tells you is, it is a, a larger decay constant. Well, let me ask you a question then. Would a larger decay constant mean a faster or a slower decaying isotope? <coughs> a larger decay constant, correct, means that you've got more of these decays happening per second. So a larger lambda means faster decay. And we also can define a quantity called the half-life, which means n at t half equals 1 half n naught. So for that, all you have to do is plug in t 1 half for t and 1 half n naught for n naught. And you actually get this relation where the half-life is just log of 2 over lambda, better known as 0.693. But we'll just leave it as log of 2 for exactness. And that's all there really is for decay in half-life. So I'll pose another question to you. Something with a larger decay constant, will it have a larger or a smaller half-life? Smaller, because they're inversely related. So I'd say from this quick derivation, these are the two things to note. Is that something with a larger decay constant decays faster and therefore has a shorter half-life. So when we were separating out our isotopes in nuclear activation analysis into what Mike called the shorts and the longs, he was separating them by half-life to say that for, let's say, the same amount of activation or the same amount of creation, the ones with shorter half-lives will be hotter, more radioactive, but for less time. And so what we're going to be doing is what's called short nuclear activation analysis because we don't want to count for like days or weeks or months. Yeah? So the half life is the decay constant just a property of a given substance, given element? The decay constant is a property of the given isotope specific to that type of decay. So if we were to draw that generalized 
uh, radioactivity diagram, let's say we have potassium-40, which can either go by beta decay to uh, what comes in beta, what comes after, I think it's calcium-40, or it can go by positron or electron capture to argon-40. Each of these processes has a different half-life. And then in that chain, remember, let's, let's do the americium-241. And I'm going to channel my one-year-old son in drawing this decay diagram. Looks something like that, with all sorts of transitions. I didn't scream like he usually does, but yeah, whatever. We're on camera. Each of these, decay, each of these transitions may also have its own half-life, so between isomeric transitions. They're usually very, very fast, but once in a while, they're not. Like technetium-99 metastable to technetium-99 has a half-life of around six days, which is why it's so useful as a medical isotope. So when you see something marked M for metastable, all that means is there's some sort of a gamma, also known as an IT transition, with a particularly long half-life. Everyone clear on what all that means? Cool. Well, there'll be some time for it to sink in because with these definitions in hand, I want to pose a problem to you guys. Let's say um, I start off with some amount of an isotope N1. And it decays by some mechanism, we don't care what, to isotope N2. And it decays to some isotope N3 with decay constants lambda 1 and lambda 2. This is what we call serial radioactive decay. How do we construct a system of equations to tell us what is n1 as a function of time, what is n2 as a function of time, and what is n3 as a function of time? Where do we begin in a general sense? OK, so let's start with n1. We kind of have an expression for n1 already. But let's start out with a differential equation. So the form of all of these equations for everything serial radioactive decay and burning isotopes in a reactor and creating isotopes in a reactor is going to take the following form. The general equation is simple. The change equals creation minus destruction. Or the simple thing is, let's say, the, the change is a source minus a sink. And we'll have to come up for every one of these isotopes for a mathematical way to describe what's the source and what's the sink. So if we want to measure the change in N1 as a function of time, what are the sources of isotope N1? Yeah? No sources. We're starting off with some fixed quantity of N1. Let's just call it N1 not. But you're right, there's no continuous source of isotope N1. What about its destruction? Decay to N2. Yeah, decay to N2, so we've got the equation for that right there. It depends on the decay constant of number one and the amount of number one. So what we're doing here, I love how this course is timed with 1803 because you're learning ordinary differential equations in 1803 and we're going to be solving ordinary differential equations for a fair bit of this course. So it's one of those rare times when you get to like learn math and put it to use at the same time instead of six years later, which is kind of nice. So that's easy. Let's go to the uh, more challenging one. What is the source of isotope N2? Decay from N1. So how would I mathematically write that? Just lambda 1, n1. And what is the destruction of isotope n2? n2? Anyone else? Takes the same form. 
It depends on the decay constant of isotope 2 and the amount of isotope 2 that's there. How about isotope 3? Where does that come from? That's it. The source is lambda 2 and 2. What are the sinks or the destruction? Nothing. Nothing. So we have a rarely very simple set of Pose differential equations to describe the production and the destruction of these three isotopes. So let's imagine now that N1 was, let's say, radium, which exists all throughout the soil and rocks. N2 is radon, the gas that's produced from radium decay. And then N3 could be, well, let's say, this, one of the stable daughter products of radon. So these are the sorts of calculations that are done all the time in real life to see if you know how much radium's in the rock, how much radon do you expect to breathe in? Because at the same time, you're producing radon from radium decay. And the radon is decaying itself. So you can't just say, oh, the activity of the radium equals the amount of radon because it's being created and destroyed all at the same time. And it depends on how much there is around. Same thing with nuclear activation analysis. You'll, let's say, you'd start off with sodium-21. You can create sodium-22. Sodium-22 will decay by positron emission. What comes before sodium? Probably neon. I think, 22. That's my guess. Yeah. So if you want to say how much sodium-22 is there, well, you're both creating it from sodium-21 from neutron absorption, and you're decaying it naturally by positron emission, among other processes. We're going to get back into how do we deal with the neutrons thing probably on Tuesday. But for now, let's work on solving this system of equations. So I think N1 is pretty easy because we already have the solution for it. So I'll just write it. 1t. The harder one is N2. So what can we start by doing? We've got an ordinary differential equation with it's just this first order, but there's two variables. So how do we deal? We do, well, we have other equations. So actually, we've got this one. Yes, substitute n1 in here. So we get everything in terms of n2 and constants in time. So we'll rewrite this equation as dn2 dt, which I'm also just going to write as n2 prime. I'm going to use this little bit of notation that I'll leave up there on the board, because it's going to be a lot faster in writing, which equals lambda 1 and 10 e to the minus lambda 1 t minus lambda 2 n 2. Can we separate variables here? I don't see an easy way. So 1803 experts, how do we solve this type of first order differential equation? And I'll give you, a, I'll, I'll, won't give you a hint, I'll give you a little bit of consolation. No one from last year knew how to approach this. So if you don't know, I won't be disappointed. Yep? Mm-hmm. So basically put add lambda to n2 to both sides. Add lambda to n2 to both sides. I think you're on to what I'm thinking about. Also, if you can't read something I write, please stop me and let me know, and I'll be happy to erase it. I don't think I've said that yet, but it takes a lot of control for me to get my handwriting legible on the board, let alone on a piece of paper. So if you can't read, please let me know. OK, so now we've got the N2s separate from the N1s. What do we do next? OK, let's try this. Assume N2 has the form e to the what? Uh, negative lambda 1t. Negative, has the form e to the lambda negative 1t. With an a. With an a, some constant in front. 
What makes you say that? Mm -hmm. Cool. So that, that is one way to do it. It's going to get a little messy, though. There's another method specifically for equations of the form. Let's call it y prime plus, I'm going to use notation they may have used in 1803. I hear a couple of aha. Uh -huh. Anything look familiar about this type of equation? OK, what is it? <laughs> it's not that hard. Anyone remember the uh, word integrating factor? <laughs> and it was probably done horribly in on like six math boards or whatever. So I'm going to show you the simpler way to do this. The idea here is we want to multiply everything by some by something, by some function mu. Put a mu there, put a mu there, put a mu there. I think that's the notation that's usually used in differential equations, such that this thing right here is shrinkable through the product rule. Where the product rule, just I'm not assuming everyone remembers, says that, let's say you have some function a of t, b of t prime is like a prime times b plus a times b prime. So we're kind of getting around to the method that Luke was talking about, but we're going to do it by a little bit of a cleaner way. We multiply every term by some function mu such that this part is one of these perfect product rules, at which point we can shrink and integrate the expression. Without going through the derivation of how integrating factors are done, I'll just let you know that this function mu ends up being e to the integral of p. That is our integrating factor. So that's the end result of what was probably six boards of 1803. Am I, am I right or am I mistaken? Wow, things haven't changed in 15 years. Cool. OK, so what is mu for this equation? Luckily. P of t is pretty simple. Which part of this equation right here is our P of t-like term? Actually, just lambda 2. Because we've got our variable right here. That right there is our P of t. So we'll just say that mu equals e to the integral of, uh, yep, of lambda 2 dt, which is just e to the lambda 2t. That's our integrating factor right there. So we'll multiply every term right here by that. So we'll say e to the lambda 2t times n2 prime plus lambda 2 e to the lambda 2t. Anyone see what's going on here? There's the product rule thing going on, times n2 plus e to the lambda 2t times lambda 1 and 10 e to the minus lambda 1t equals 0. And we have successfully created something here that can be shrunk up with the product rule. Yep? Uh, oh yeah, there's an equal sign there, isn't there? That's what tripped me up. Thank you. So there is indeed a minus sign there because I skipped the step, putting everything on one side of the equation. Yep? Can you make a variation to the integration Where you replace one variable with a, or replace a couple variables with another one? Um, well, yeah, it's just like a factor. Yeah. There are, there are lots of ways of solving a first order ODE like this. Sure. So this would work with variation of parameters. It would work with what Luke's talking about. It works with this one. This just happens to be a particularly simple one because the integrating factor is so simple. So let's cram this up right here. So this is like saying n2 times e to the lambda 2t prime minus 
and we've got two e to the somethings that we can combine right here. So I'll just say lambda 1 and 10 e to the lambda 2 minus lambda 1 t equals 0. So now I will put this term back on the other side by doing that. And now we just integrate both sides. And we get n2 e to the lambda 2 t equals, let's see, comes lambda 1 n10 over lambda 2 minus lambda 1 e to the lambda 2 minus lambda 1 t plus some integration constant c. And in this case, our initial condition, well, how much of isotope N2 did we start with? Have we specified that yet? No? Let's make it simple. Let's assume that the initial amount of isotope N2 equals 0. We put some isotope in the reactor or started off with some amount of isotope like radium. Didn't start off with any, didn't start off with any radon and just kept going. So then all we have to do is divide each side by e to the lambda 2t. That cancels those. That cancels that and that. And we end up with n2 as a function of time equals lambda 1 n1 naught over lambda 2 minus lambda 1 times e to the minus lambda 1t. Okay, and we've got an expression for N2. How about N3? Do we even have to solve this one? See, a couple of people shaking their heads no. Why is that? Well, not quite, because we are, we have, well, yeah, I guess we've kind of solved it for N1, but now we take this expression for N2, stick it in here, and then solve that. It's going to get messy. So I'm going to show you something mathematically now that I'll show you graphically later. There's a conservation equation that we're missing here. If we sum up isotopes N1, N2, N3 equals what? Conserving total number of atoms. Exactly. N1 naught. In this situation where we started off with some known quantity of isotope 1 only, you can't change the number of atoms here. You can only change the type of atoms. So we don't have to solve for E3. I'm oh, sorry, for N3, because N3 is just N1 naught minus N1 minus N2. And that takes like an extra 10 minutes out of today's lecture. So later on when we have a projector on Tuesday, I will show you these equations graphed out where I've actually, I'll share this with you. Did I tell you guys about the Desmos graphical calculator? Or have I shown this to you yet? Go here for all of your graphing needs. It's free, and the best part that I like is that any time you define some parameter, it automatically makes a slider bar. So you can play with the equations, and you can just Say like, well, what if L1 and L, L, lambda 1 and L2 were equal? What if they were way different? And it just graphs the solutions for you. It's pretty useful. So I'll show you some of that uh, on Tuesday when we actually have a screen. Let me see what time it is. Oh, sweet. We've got plenty of time. So now I want to pose the following questions to you guys. I'm going to erase stuff from here because we still have some space. How do we model nuclear activation analysis using this kind of equation? We'll start off with the same equation. So let's say we'll have a minus lambda 1 n1. We'll have n2 minus lambda 2 n2 minus something. And 3 equals something. Let's see, there's a lambda 1 n1. There's a lambda 2 n2 minus something. I've left some trailing minus signs to indicate that we don't have complete equations for this yet. 
So for the case of nuclear activation analysis, where we have some imposed flux, flux of neutrons, does anyone remember from some of our previous flash forwards, how do we turn these into <coughs> creation and destruction rates of these different isotopes? Yep, so let's say we are, we've now stuck N1 in the reactor. And we're now using the reactor to create different isotopes like N2 and N3. But at the same time, they're in the reactor. They're getting cooked as well by some imposed flux of neutrons. How do we set up and not solve the system of equations to describe this? Yeah, they're getting destroyed and whatnot. Are, are they just like decaying or are they also getting like, like added stuff from the reaction? Well, that, that, depends on the isotope. that depends on the isotope. So let's define what the system, the system is. Let's say we stuck in some other isotope N0. And we put it in, and we're going to have to say it's, if we have N0 prime, so minus some creation term. And in this case, N0 can absorb a neutron to become N1. N1 is decaying to N2. N2 is decaying to N3. But also, N1 can be burned by neutrons, and N2 can be burned by neutrons, and N3 can be burned by neutrons. So here I've given you kind of a simplistic uh, situation that doesn't usually exist. Here I've given you a situation that you can replicate in the reactor. How do we model this nuclear activation analysis process? Well, first of all, what's the creation rate of N0, the stuff we put in the reactor? Are we creating any? No? Luke? It could be. So if we had this fo the following nuclear reaction, now it's getting crazy. We can model that too. <laughs> let's do it. OK, I was going to say no, but let's do it. We can, so I'm, what I'm trying to do here is give you the mathematical tools to model any real physical situation. Usually in this class, like when I took it, the discussion stopped here. And we got to start looking at different graphs of secular versus transient equilibrium like in the reading. But I want you guys to have the intuition to say, all right, let's take any crazy decay diagram, right? And N3 becomes N1. Let's just go nuts. <laughs> How do we set up the differential equations for this, assuming that computers can solve them? In every case, where's my long pointer? Go back to this here. The change is the creation minus the destruction. So what are all the creation sources in our new scenario for N0? Well, I'll pose you a simpler question. If there is no isotope N2, can you create any N0? No, because the only way to make N0 is to start with N2. So we know its creation term is going to have an N2 in it. What else does it depend on? I heard both of the pieces of the answer correct at the same time. It depends on the flux of neutrons. And it depends on the cross-section, this macroscopic cross-section right here. OK? Or I'm sorry, no, no. It depends on the microscopic cross-section, because we have an amount of N2. But it does depend on how many neutrons you throw at it, and what is the probability that each of those neutrons makes some N0. So what we've got right here is a reaction rate. So who remembers from the like, second or third lecture, we said a reaction rate can be expressed like macroscopic cross-section times a flux, which is the same as a microscopic cross-section times number density times flux. 
but this is better known as a macroscopic cross-section. Remember, I, I kind of showed this to you very briefly when we talked about cross-sections. Now is where we actually use them. So the cross-section is like the probability that a neutron coming in to atom n is going to react with it. The macroscopic cross-section in units of, let's say, 1 over centimeters is the total, let's say, the total probability accounting for how many are there. And the flux is in neutrons per centimeter squared per second. Combine these together, and you get a reaction rate in atoms per centimeter cubed per second, a volumetric reaction rate. There we go. So N1 can be created. Let's give this cross-section a designation from N2 to N0. So let's call it cross-section 2, 0. How can N not be destroyed? I'll give you a hint. It looks very similar to this term. Anyone want to take a guess? Yeah? Uh, we haven't specified that. I'm going I'm to cut the craziness at there, <laughs> I think. But just look at the reactions right here. N naught can absorb a neutron and become N1. So how do we mathematically write that? Yep, minus the cross-section of, let's say, 0 going to 1. Let's just call it that. Times the neutron flux. Yeah. Times what? Times, N times the amount that's there, n naught. So this is your destruction term. Using this pattern, we can fill in all the remaining terms for all the remaining isotopes. So what are the creation mechanisms for isotope N1? We'll just follow the arrows. Same term mm -hmm. in the first equation, so it doesn't yep. There's this one right here. We but can have, but flip the sign because it's creation. So sigma O1 flux N naught. And what else can create N1? Because we're just going crazy today. N3 can create N1 because we said so. But yeah, because we said so. Uh, so now we'll say also we'll have this cross section for. 3 turning into 1 times flux times N3 minus the decay of N1 using our activity expression minus what else? I heard some, yep, cross, there'll be the cross section of N1. Let's call it going to some isotope we don't care about times the flux times N1. So as long as you can draw a like arrow decay and destruction production diagram, we can put this to math. That's the crazy thing. Let's finish it up. How about N2? We know that N1 can decay to N2. What are the other production mechanisms for N2? Follow the arrows. That's it. That's because we're not changing anything at this point. What are all the destruction mechanisms for N2? Yep, it can decay. It can be absorbed by a neutron to become something we don't care about. Let's see, let's call it cross section 2 null times flux times N2 minus the cross section from 2 to 0, just this term with a minus sign. How about N3? What are all the ways we can make N3? So you say it a little louder? Only from, decay. Only from decay. Again, just see which arrows are pointing at it. And what about the destruction mechanisms for N3? Yep. So there's some probability it decays, let's say, cross section 3 null times flux times N3 minus this arrow going back to N1. We're running out of space, too many units from 3 to 1, flux, and 3. So the point of accepting the 
escalation of this problem into something crazy is that it doesn't matter how crazy it gets. As long as you have like an arrow-based diagram or a flowchart to say which isotopes become which other isotopes by which other means, you can pose and correctly write the set of equations that defines them. This is when I would bring in MATLAB or Mathematica. I could make you do this analytically, but this isn't a course 18 class, and yeah, we don't want to go there. Cool. So I think, I guess it's probably getting towards 10 of 10 of. Close enough. It's like 3 of 10 of. So I'd like to open it uh, up to any questions because we let this, I let this escalate freely to prove the point that as long as you know what decays into what or what creates or destroys what, you can set up the equations correctly. And what we'll be doing on Tuesday is graphing this, where we can pose an arbitrarily complex set of equations and you can start looking at, well, the change in one depends on the amount of the other, and you can almost graphically solve these on paper. Forget Mathematica or MATLAB. If you look at last year's exam, I actually posed a more complex set of these and said, draw the solution. And I'm gonna, we're going to show you how to do that. But any question on how we formed these? Yep. What is sigma by the So we just said, let's say N3 decay to some, decays to some isotope we don't care about. Okay. That's how I initially had it. And then I think Luke said, well, can N2 become N0? And I said, yeah, sure. So there can be a cross-section for every type of reaction. So in reality, you might have any reaction under the sun, right? One isotope could absorb a neutron and decay by like any of three or four different mechanisms into something else. You may have different probabilities for each of these. Yep. Um, the only time I'd expect you to find these decay constants is if I told you what these isotopes were. Those are also listed on the table of nuclides, as in they give you the half-life, and you know from this half-life relation what the decay constant is. If I didn't tell you what these isotopes were, I would just have you keep these symbols as lambda 1, lambda 2. And I might pose a question which we'll solve graphically on Tuesday, like let's say solve this set of equations for lambda 2 is much greater than lambda 1. I don't care what the numbers are, let's just look at that general relation. And all the graphs for that sort of situation will follow the same uh, pattern. Cool. Any other questions on how we constructed this set of differential equations? And know that I'll never ask you to solve them numerically or analytically. Thank you. Yeah, that's why we have computers and this is the future. These, I might expect you to know how to derive, but this is the simplest possible case. Cool. All right, if there's no questions, then let's take another 10 minute break and I'll be here for recitation to go over whatever problems you guys would like to do.